G'day everyone and welcome to my review of the 2023 release from Ascision of the New South Wales Railways HO Scale Alco 44 Class Mark 1. This review is made possible by the Patreons on Patreon and if you'd like to see more reviews like this, please consider joining the community. In this review, we're going to take a look at what you get in the box, what the locomotive's like, some running shots, as well as some sound samples, as I did pick up a DCC and sound equipped model. And then at the end, I'll come back and tell you all about what I think of it. So let's get into it. So let's take a look at the prototype. The 44s were built from 1957 until 1967 by A.E. Goodwin in Auburn. They totaled 100 units, although they were in two batches. The first being 60, built from July 1957 to April 1961, and the second of 40 locos, built between October 1965 and December 1967. So it would be 4401 to 4460 a Mark I, and 4461 to 44100 a Mark II. The different eras had different models of engine block different traction motors and gear ratios, different engine governors, and the Mark I had a GE governor that would shut down the engine straight away if power was lost, which caused a rhythmic surging at idle. The Mark II had a woodward electric hydraulic governor, similar to most other New South Wales diesels. They had different vigilant control systems, and the Mark II number box lights on the number two end had a separate red and white marker lights. I'm sure there are other differences, but this southerner just doesn't know enough. There are still a small number of Mark 144s in various stages of preservation, with 4403 still running heritage trips in 2023. Now, I got 4403 in freight rail. I went with this locomotive over the others because it's one I actually got to see running in this livery when it ran in Melbourne back in 2007 on a Phantom of the Opera special. And it's a nice memory that I have. And I know it ran in this livery from about the early 90s, which is the era that I collect, so I thought it was fitting. That, and it does almost look like the Victorian Railways livery. Now this release did come with many different liveries and paint schemes that the 44s ran with over their lifetime, like Indian Red, Austerity, Reverse, Candy, and the preserved 3801 Limited. Although the box isn't something I usually dwell on as it is pretty generic and it is, I guess, the least interesting part of the model. However, this time round, Ascision has done away with the clamshell packaging that they've had with previous models. And this time they've gone for a soft foam housing, which I for one am much happier to see. And I found that getting the model in and out of the box much easier and less likely to damage it. Now, these are the model's features. These models came in both DC and DCC sound versions with a plastic ABS body. They've got metal blackened disc wheels, which are RP25 110s, scale size metal knuckle couplers. They feature a highly detailed underframe with separately applied metal parts. They have brass horns, metal and plastic handrails, as well as brake piping. They have highly detailed bogies with separately applied parts. These came factory painted and decorated and they will operate on a minimum of an 18 inch radius curve. They are also made to operate on code 70, 83 and 100 rail. They had eight different body versions tooled with single and double marker lights. They also feature a highly detailed cabin with painted driver figures, metal etched mirrors and windscreen wipers, see-through metal etched grills. They have operating LED headlights and marker lights with manual override switches underneath the locomotive. The models have five pole skew wound motors with twin brass flywheels. They are all wheel drive and all wheel electrical pickup. On the DC model, they are DCC ready, requiring a 21 pin decoder. They feature a heavy die cast chassis. And Ascision says that these are the most accurate and highly detailed 44 classes available on the market. As for the sound models, they're equipped with ESU lock sound V5 21 pin decoders full throttle, Cision Vandegaard speaker enclosures with twin speakers, which are loaded with prototypical sound files. The Alco 12251B engine startup, shutdown, idle and running. Dynamic brakes, Westinghouse and Wabco AA BB air horns, brake squealing, coupler, release and crash, handbrake applied and release.
The model also comes with an exploded diagram if you do want to pull this thing apart, as well as a double-sided sheet of DCC commands, maintenance, and other how-tos. So since I've got a sound fitter model, we'll have a quick listen to the sounds and then we'll get it out on the AMRA layout in Melbourne to see how it goes running in the real world. So here's my two cents. Is this model worth the $465 I paid for it? And the short answer is yes. The pulling power on this model is fantastic. It could easily pull a good sized freight rake around the layout and I had no performance issues with it whatsoever. No derailing and no shorting out. And I really don't have anything bad to say about its performance. The model itself is also quite a quiet runner. So if you get a non-sound or a DC version, well, you won't have any problems. If you do get a sound equipped one, the sound is good. It's loud and clear, and I don't have any problems with the sound. I like the detail on this model, with the finer parts like the staff exchanger, grips, mirrors, shunter steps, as well as under detailing. And I like that they added the crew at one end. And it does have some nice cab detailing in the number two end. The small amount of riding on this locomotive is clear and legible. All round, it feels like a solid and well-built model and has a nice weight to it. Now here's what I don't like. 
On close inspection, you can see that the line work around the cab is not super sharp, and where the yellow meets the blue isn't as heavy and it seems to have bled into it somewhat. Now, for me, this isn't a huge issue, as one, it's only noticeable when you are super close to the model, or if you've got a macro lens like I do. So from the one meter rule, I highly doubt this makes for any issue. And secondly, I know I'm gonna get this thing weathered, so it won't matter at all. Now, the other thing that I don't like, which has nothing to do with the quality of the model, and it's something that I've brought up before, and it's something I'm going to keep mentioning. It's 2023, and these were available for yes. about two years or so via mail away order. It would be great to see Ascision and other manufacturers follow what some others have done in the industry, which is doing online pre-orders. MailAway, in my opinion, is antiquated and unsafe, which is one of the reasons I won't do MailAway order forms in 2023. Now, I've been on this rant before, and it's something that I'm going to bring up every time with every model until the pre-order system is modernized. So if you are after one, or maybe a couple, you can get them directly from Decision or Australian Modeler via their website, and I'll leave a link for them below, as well as a preservation group who still have the 44s, and where you can find more information on the prototype. So there we go, that was the review, and I hope you've enjoyed it. If you do have any feedback or thoughts about this model, do leave it in the comments section below. Perhaps you picked one up, perhaps it was one that you were thinking about getting, and now you do want to get one. Although, at the time of recording this, a lot of them are sold out, especially the DCC and sound ones. But then again, looking at the popularity of them, it does make me wonder if we're going to get a Mark II 44. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll be back soon. Hey,